computers are cursed. This video has been torturous to make and has changed shape so many times now, I've lost count. This whole thing started out because I completely ran out of space for my footage. My archive storage was full, my live editing storage was full, and my recording drives were full. So I just had to stop and fix this so I could get back to making videos again. And oh boy, was that an adventure. I wrote out a whole script detailing everything that went wrong and how it was fixed, but that ended up probably being like 50 minutes long. And after getting that done, I got a GPU for the server, throwing all that out, and I would have to rewrite it. So I'm just gonna focus on how this setup turned out and how well it's working for me now. But before that, just to give you an idea of how much of a pain this really was, let me read through some highlights of the problems, just uh, for a little taste. <clears throat> After pulling the server from the rack, I found that the fan for my custom cooling solution for the 10 gigabit ethernet card had seized, so I instead opted to mount a bigger fan over all of the cards that should work out much better. Similarly, two of the three main case fans had also seized. I was able to nudge one of them back to life, but all three of them, and probably the two on the back as well, need to be replaced now that they are failing. I took a second look at the LSI HBA card that I was sent that didn't work, and after much investigation, found that the SBR addresses and the firmware for the main IC had been wiped, and I had to take a guess at reprogramming it with values from another card to get it working again. All of my remaining mini SAS SATA breakout cables were forward when I needed them to be reverse, because mini SAS and SATA decided to use two different standards despite being electrically identical. And right after installing those new mini SAS cables, the power supply died. Of course, I had to take the time to verify it wasn't one of the cards, CPUs, or RAM, and go dig the original power supply out of storage to get the final answer that the 1200 watt BFG had in fact keeled over. So I ordered a new refurbished power supply because my all has been getting hit pretty hard here, but it came with cables from different generations of power supplies, so I had to go through and check the pinout of all of those to make sure they weren't going to fry something. This was fine in the end, but it wasn't the most confidence-inspiring thing, and for the cherry on top, I was shorted a couple cables as well. Once I was finally all done, I got the hard drives installed. Some of them didn't work. I saw this coming though, and it turned out that my backplanes have 3.3 volt regulars on them for every single drive. And these newfangled drives have standby pins there instead, and the 3.3 volt power supply keeps them active, forcing the drives to be permanently off. So I'd order some Kapton to block off those pins so the drives would actually spin up. And after confirming they all turn on, and I set them up in some different RAID configurations, the performance was terrible. It took days of learning and troubleshooting to finally nail down all the issues, but basically, don't put partitions on RAIDs, and if your hard drive say SATA AF, don't make life ah, don't laugh at the easy joke, and make sure the file system will work for advanced format drives! <sighs> and that is about three weeks worth of agony summed up in three minutes. This has been anything but simple. This video is brought to you by Linode, and that may seem a little unusual considering this is about my server, but there's actually a case to be made for rendering with cloud computing. While Linode offers traditional virtual servers around the world that allow you to host typical web services like WordPress, Git, or SQL databases, they also offer more advanced services like GPU compute on a Quadro RTX 6000 for a buck fifty an hour. They also offer storage hosting that lets you get a terabyte of data at 14 cents an hour. My average video is about 500 gigabytes and would take about 4 hours to upload at a gigabit a second. It would easily take less than 3 hours to render and an hour to download back. So for 8 hours of storage and 3 hours of GPU, that's only a bit under $6 to render a video, though you may need to add a dedicated VPS to that as well. It's going to take me 6 to 8 months to beat that on ROI, and my renders are going to be way slower. So it's worth considering cloud computing for tasks that you might not normally. If you want to try Linode, check the description for a link to get a free $20 credit. That's like two to three video renders. Now, if you're newer to the channel, you may not be familiar with the fact that I run a server or what I have here. If you want to see much more on it, I have about five videos now and what all has gone into setting it up. But I'll quickly go through what all is here to bring you up to speed for now. Deep down in there beats the heart of a super micro server that was designed for a 1U chassis. I was sent the board, CPUs, and RAM separately to fit into this much larger 4U 16 bay Norco chassis I was able to pick up locally. Unfortunately, shipping broke the board's IPMI, but everything else works fine. It has two Xeon E52690 CPUs totaling 32 threads with 96 gigabytes of RAM, and I've outfitted it with larger third-party coolers for this huge, less managed airflow case. 
Until now, every card I've added to the system has been in some way meant for I.O. There's a dual SAS card, a SCSI controller for the LTO drive, and a 10 gigabit Ethernet card that I use to directly connect to my main editing system. Storage has been where this system was lacking the most. Until now, it contained four 500 gigabyte SSDs in a RAID Z1 pool, and a smattering of external hard drives turned internal. But except for editing off of the SSDs, video footage has never been stored on this server. Unbeknownst to me, this HP i3 based system was being readied with 8 terabytes of effective storage space to be sent to me around the same time I was putting together my server. It was sent by someone who doesn't want to be mentioned, but I'll let them know here that it has been very useful, because it let me put off storage upgrades until I was in a much better position to do so. And that time has come, because I have completely filled that thing. The solution I've been able to put in place here, though, has come out much better than I would have ever guessed. Firstly, the SSDs have been changed over to RAID 0, and are now only going to be used for cache files, proxies, and used as the target drives for rendering videos. Imported raw assets are now going to be stored on two 6TB Seagate NAS drives in RAID 1. One of these drives was kindly sent to me by Andrew, and I'm very appreciative of it because this whole project has really bled me dry. The read speeds for these drives are plenty fast enough for rendering, and with the proxies being on SSDs, I'm not really editing off of them. So I get about four times the storage space for concurrent projects, full data redundancy, and the speed of editing off of SSDs. In the testing I've done, so far this blows away everything about how I was working before, so I couldn't be happier with the results. But that's not archival storage, and that's where I've been hurting the most, so I have a different set of drives for that. The capacity of the last storage was 8 terabytes, but that's just the size of the drives I'm starting with this time, and I went all out with four of these to make the most of setting up a long-term array. On that, these are going to be used in RAID 5, giving me about 22 terabytes of total storage after everything is said and done. Even after I move in the old data, that should give me about two to three years before I need to look into buying more drives, so I'm very happy with that capacity jump. At this point, I'll pause to let anyone finish writing their comments telling me about all the URIs I'm going to get here for using RAID 5. <sighs> Terraria 1.4 came out pretty recently. It's not bad. Master mode's a little hard, though. Alright, done? Okay. I'm not worried about it. I'm already checking for pre-fail signs with the drive smart info with automated tasks. And additionally, if the drives die and I lose data, I will consider it a personal failure because I now have everything in place here to begin backing up to my LTO4 drive and to cloud storage for true triple redundancy. So if the array dies on a rebuild, it shouldn't be the end of the world. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, well, let me give you some general information on RAID and data storage in general. I'll just get it out of the way right now though that RAID is not a backup. It's only to prevent significant downtime to data access. That's why I'm going to be writing to tape and offsite storage. But RAID does stand for redundant array of something or another disks. And in the type of setup I'm doing, using RAID will allow me to have a single drive fail but not lose access to the data. The way this works is by using something called a parity bit. Different RAID setups give you different parity bit implementations, and this is a topic deep enough to deserve its own video, but in brief, for an arbitrary number of data points, you can lose one of them for each parity value you have and still be able to recreate the data. RAID 5 gives you one parity bit, RAID 6 gives you two, and RAID 7 gives you three. These are also the same as ZFS 1, 2, and 3, respectively. But for each parity bit you want, you need to dedicate an entire drive's worth of data, which will sacrifice total usable capacity. But another real-world problem you can run into is if you start out with all new drives of the same model, like I am here. Since the drives are going to be identical and used in the same circumstances, they will all wear at about the same rate. This means that if one drive fails, the chances are high that another drive could fail soon as well. This is where a URE or unrecoverable read error may happen. Another drive could encounter an issue while the missing data is being rebuilt using the parity bits, causing all of the data to be lost. And since the drives need to be read from beginning to end to recalculate the data for the failed drives, it's not a light load on the then-aged drives. 
That's why it's important to have a true backup of really important data somewhere completely different. Weighing the risks versus the space trade-offs for me with my gigantic data sets and the fact that I have the ability to do real backups, I'm less concerned about the potential failure possibilities. So this is a setup that I'm going forward with for the archive array. Now, if I combine that with the current project drives and the SSDs, I have about 30 terabytes of video storage in this server now. I'm also going to be converting that HP system to a dedicated file server for all of my other needs and offloading the other data that I have on the external drives. And with that, I should have about 60 terabytes of raw storage in the server when I'm done. So I should be good for a very long time. Now, the other half of this upgrade went mercifully smoothly. Well, at least compared to the hard drives and most of the other times I've installed my editing software on Linux. And that was setting up a GTX 1070 with the server for remote rendering with DaVinci Resolve. Since I've first started this channel, I've always been using a server for as much work as I possibly can, because offloading large tasks away from your working system can help you be as productive as possible. I even had headless server rendering with Blender before I bought my new camera. So this is an upgrade I've put off for far too long, and I realized I was wasting a lot of time by not just doing it. So I decided to roll it into the drive upgrades while I had the server out. Now, the first problem for setting up remote rendering was choosing a GPU. I was lucky to have the opportunity to get a 1080 Ti for my desktop just for the amount of VRAM alone. It has a whopping 11 gigabytes that I have still been able to fill with my 4K 60 FPS footage. Those seem to have only gone up in price though since I bought mine, so I wanted to try and get something else. AMD is unfortunately a no-go for me on working on Linux, NVENC is just kind of king. So I was considering a GTX 1660 since it has the newer touring NVENC, but 1070s go for about the same price with more VRAM, which is more important to me with 4K. I also needed a card that would absolutely fit in only two slots, because getting the card in the server is a significant challenge. One of the CPUs is positioned right behind the only 16x PCIe slot on the board, so I either had to find an extra short card, which are less common, or use a riser cable to move the card to the space next to the motherboard where I had two free slots. Going with the riser cable also gave me the most options and kept all the other PCIe slots free. After narrowing my options down and looking around, I was able to pick up this 1070 locally for an okay price that meets all of my requirements. The fit is still tight up against, well, everything. <laughs> I figured I needed to use a right angle riser to not hit the bottom of the case, but that runs into the side of the motherboard, so I raised the whole card up with some standoffs. So in the end, any riser probably would have worked. There's also not a whole lot of space with the card up against the side of the case. I am afraid of airflow concerns, but after watching some test renders, it seems to be doing fine, barely reaching 72C while still boosting. If it does get bad, I can always drill some holes in the side of the case anyway to give it some fresh air. But with the card finally in there, after waiting a year and a half, I can in fact do server-based rendering with DaVinci Resolve. Now, I have my video assets mounted in the same location on both my desktop and the server, so my project management is easy. On my desktop, of course, though, it's mounted over NFS, which is one of the advantages the server has in this setup. And in pure transcoding or NVENC jobs, the server is now faster because of its local file access. For just NVENC, there isn't much difference between the 1080 Ti and the 1070, so I'm not really losing any performance there. This will also help with another aspect of editing, proxy or optimized media creation, which is just another name for transcoding, essentially. So that will also be handled by the server as well. Well, everything's gonna be on the server. <sighs> but actually rendering, mm, <laughs> in some tests, I saw render times around 50% longer on the 1070. That's a pretty big deal when some of my videos have already taken six hours or longer to render on the 1080 Ti, but the way I see it, I paid around 40% of the cost for almost 70% of the performance, so it was still a good value. And it doesn't really matter all that much to me. 
Server render time is, in my eyes, different than desktop render time, since I can still use my desktop while it's going on. Nine hours spent rendering on the server impacts me less than having my desktop tied up for six hours. And if there's a project that I need to do a quick turnaround on anyway, I can always use my desktop still. But I would much rather send the job off to the server and not have to worry about it most of the time. And if it ever bothers me, I can try swapping the 1070 and the 1080 and see if I can just edit on 8 gigabytes. I'm not really optimistic about that though. Now I'll throw some tips in here about getting Resolve running because it is always a pain. First off, you must have a GUI. Yes, even for the headless version. And you can't just forward X over SSH either. It will always throw all sorts of ALSA errors and crash because Linux sound is just great. There is an alternative to running a full desktop environment though, and I'm gonna show that in just a moment. To start, go ahead and install the latest normal or headless NVIDIA drivers on your system. You'll also need OpenCL, which is under a new weird package name, and I'd just install the lib and dev versions. It's weird and I'm not sure which you need, although you really shouldn't need the dev version, but whatever. There are a few other things you need to install, like libssl, but I'll just put everything I installed in the description, that way you can just copy paste it. For installing DaVinci Resolve itself, you'll definitely want to use Make Resolve Deb. It makes all of this go much smoother, at least assuming you're not installing on CentOS like they want to, because ugh. Now to work around the GUI thing, I'm using X2Go, which will let you run a full dedicated X or GUI session over SSH. It's a different way of doing remote desktop, but it isn't running unless you want it to. If you log out of your desktop environment, it closes completely and isn't using any resources anymore. But you can also detach from it as well, which is really useful for running a render server. You'll need to pick a desktop environment to install and use with it. XFCE and LXDE would be good ones that are lower resource options, and I'm using XFCE here. One last thing you may need to do comes from EposVox, and that is changing some settings for Postgres SQL to make it work locally. I'm not 100% sure if you need to do this. I didn't test it, but it still worked afterwards, so it doesn't hurt. And you will definitely want to use Postgres SQL for sanely sharing projects between systems, because exporting and importing? No. But with all that in place, it is very easy to start Resolve and set it to remote rendering mode or just launch it from the GUI console with the dash RR option to not have the whole thing running. Then on your client systems, just click the signal icon, I guess, and select your server name to set it as a remote job. Then click start render and it's off. While you're running a render or other task, if you want to monitor your NVIDIA card, you may want to also install NVIDIA-SMI, which gives you a lot of the status info on your cards even which programs are using resources. That's how I've been monitoring the 1070. And that's pretty much all I've got for tips, and I think caps off the server upgrade as a whole. I am really excited to finally be done, and I'm looking forward to not having to deal with storage issues anymore for quite some time. And the offloaded rendering is going to be a huge weight lifted now that I can start tasks whenever I want and not have to worry about wasting a whole day waiting for my desktop to become available. I want to give a special shout out here at the end though to Jartrol who sent me the LSI card but also gave me a lot of advice on setting up the raid stuff and more tips for the GUI like X2Go. But now I need to go stuff the server back in the rack and get editing this video. So if you enjoyed this, you may want to stick around by subscribing. And if you want to support the channel, I am on Patreon. But for now, that's it, and I'll see you next time.